Hey, hey everyone, this is Chris Diaz from DSX Machina and the GMS Magazine Podcast. I have a very special guest. I have, I, you got to have faith. Oh. You got to, yeah. You have faith, Elizabeth, is it Lily? Is it Lily? Oh. Yes. Yeah, uh, it is, cool. yeah. Faith, Elizabeth, Lily. Uh, how long, let's, let's, let's start with, who is Faith? Oh, wow. Now, there's a pretty loaded question. Um, I mean, who's Faith? So, me, uh, I'm I'm someone who uh, just tries to live a life trying to make things better for other people. I mean, it sounds a bit sort of, you know, oh, yeah, we've heard that before. But, uh, you know, uh, it's a lot of what I do in my life, you know, caring for others, trying to make things that will make other people's lives better rather than hurting people. Nice. Uh, now we'll talk about the details of 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 who is faith. We've talked about uh, your disposition, very uplifting, of course. But when did you first get into? Let's. let's like, this is going to sound like 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 a like a psychiatrist test or inside the actor studio. Uh -huh. uh, when did you first try gaming? What was the first game you played, and how old were you? Oh wow! I mean. Are we talking tabletop role play, or would you want to go into video games and board games? Let's go with uh, let's go with all of them. Let's talk about the first games you played. All right. I know we're, if we go old enough, you're not going to say Pong. Let's get into some decent stuff here. <laughs> I mean, okay. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to float this out there. Uh, I, I I was born at like near the start of the seventies. Okay, so uh, you know, board games is all. Sort of of stuff like family board games like scrabble and um stuff like that right mm -hmm. you know and things we roll dice and then uh, see if you can roll a six to start the game and uh and then i didn't and like the game was won before uh, you know i've got to roll a six that's my first introduction to people making bad game design um <laughs> so I, I love video games uh you know i i used to like regularly sort of um you know get off down into town with friends and uh you know, play uh, on games consoles there. I love that, like, do you remember that, like, Star Wars sort of uh, video game cabinet with, like, the vector graphics and stuff? I played that. Right? That was amazing back in the day. Um, but, <clears throat> like, mid-80s, uh, I discovered Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, it was a random uh, Christmas present. Uh, you know, I was taking shopping and, like, hey, uh, what do you want for Christmas? And I spotted it in the uh, store, and I'm like, what is that I've never heard of it before. That looks amazing, and uh, yeah. Was it the basic? Was it the red box, or was it? It was. It was the red box. That amazing art on the front, right? Yeah. And uh, what was your like when you got the game? Yeah. Heard the guy want this. Did you realize at that point, like, oh, this involves other people? Did you? Could you? Were you able to find a group? I mean, you know, I, I didn't even know what was going to be in there, right? It needs other players, but so of most board games, that's kind of what I expected. But I'm honestly, my mind is kind of blown. I've got like uh, several friends. And I'm like, hey, 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 I, I know it's like Christmas and we're not all back at school and everything, but like, you've got to come play this game with me because this is amazing. And I got ran, I kind of ran that first session. Um, and uh, yeah, a bunch of them were all hooked as well. Uh, so interestingly, uh, it was quite a while before I ever got to play Dungeons and Dragons after I first found it because uh, I became an instant GM. Oh, so you, you were the GM of the group? Yeah, very much so. And, and how did this transition to you deciding you wanted this to be a career? Oh, so there's a story there. The, um, <clears throat> it was uh, like the next year at school. Um, when they started doing like the careers fair stuff and they get advisors in to help you pick, you know, what are the options you want to take, what uh, what do you want to study, languages, sciences, so forth, you know, what degree might you want to go off and do? <clears throat> and the careers advisor said to me, hey, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to make Dungeons and Dragons. And they're like, what's that? And I so I explained. And they're like, yeah, maybe reset your expectations. Um, may maybe just, you know, do computers or something. Have you, so, have you, you know, tried being a janitor? <laughs> well, I you know, and I did. I went and studied. I went and did computers. Uh, I, mm. you know, I studied uh, software engineering at uh, degree level. Um, 
<clears throat> I went the route that people would expect from that, right? So I went into coding, and I moved into being a project manager and an analyst and uh, floated around that space for quite a long time. Um, then I got to the point of, uh, you know, I was uh, working hard running like several teams and uh, was being coached to move up to a director level within a really large corporation. And uh, I decided I'd had enough because like the, the catalyst point there was uh, I, I was expected to run this whole project where I worked with about 40 people in the company that we'd purchased. And I had to find out exactly how everything worked so that we could replace them with a computer system and lay them off. And I got to be the person that told them about this after we'd got all the information on how to do their job and how everything worked. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not making people's lives better. This is awful. These people could be doing this job and now they're being replaced by a computer system. So I spent uh, about two weeks actually just working with these people and making sure that uh, you know I helped them with their CVs and contacts and how to apply for jobs um, rather than what I was actually supposed to be doing. And, uh, and then I quit. And uh, it took about four or five months to try and figure out what I wanted to do and then decided I wanted to go back to what 11 year old me wanted to do Dungeons and Dragons. So, and how old are you at this point? Oh, at that point, that was like what, uh, 20, was 2017, start of 2017. So, uh, I would have been 46. So, so we definitely a bit of a pay cut. We skipped, but, uh, a, yeah, we skipped a period. Oh, yeah, we have, but it's, honestly, it's pretty boring. I mean, yeah. well. I mean, I talked to people about it, but uh, I, I did a lot. I flew around the world. I implemented systems into uh, secret facilities uh, from uh, for the government. Um, I implemented. I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. What? I have secret facilities and the government. What? What, 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 what was that? So, as part of what I was doing as a job at one company I was at. Um, like one part of that involved having to, um, like when 9-11 happened, I was right. actually like deep underground in a Marconi defense um, underground facility where, where they did all of this stuff to do with uh, a lot of the, uh, the weaponry and stuff. Um, and I didn't have a signal for outside, so I didn't even know what was going on uh, when, that, when that went down. But um, <clears throat> I just got like, uh, you know, came out of that whole thing and got a message like, feed of what was going on in the world because I've been out of it for hours. Um, but uh, I, it's obviously there's a very limited amount of things I can say about what like where that was oh, or what I was doing there. Yeah, it was just know? like it was a really boring life that I can share. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I did some stuff with uh, GCHQ in Britain as well. That was kind of that was uh, again, that's about as much as I can say about it. But that's just pretty boring other than the time I worked for MI6. But ah, that's beside the point. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, obviously, that that breadth of knowledge that you that you developed, how, how does it, is it, is it? A lot of that can carry over to what you're doing now. Like, how does sure. that background carry into what you're doing now? It does, because like you know, I've worked from like uh, from companies that did finance, that did uh, HR, they did retail, they, I've done logistics, I've done facilities management, security, uh, event management, all these companies doing all these different things. And I've worked across uh, everything from project management to QA to uh, you know, coding to uh, uh, working with the bids team on that bid negotiation. So I've learned like all these skills across all these market sectors. So it's become a bit of a joke almost at various places I've worked about the last 10 years of, ah, there's a thing that nobody knows how to do and we need a new piece of tech or there's a bit of a market. So it's like, hey, Faith, do you know anybody? And I'm like, that's no, fine. I know how this works. I've already done some stuff there and I know people. So, what was the first gaming company you worked for when you decided? Was it were you working for yourself, or did you apply? Did you join up somebody else's team? Um, so I pretty much figured, like, what? How am I going to do this? So I looked around, and uh, I discovered that uh, there's a team of uh, say five people in uh, Alabama, in the uh, U.S. Um, 
working on this project for something that was eventually going to be called D&D Beyond. And they're working for Curse, a company who um, I'd done stuff with through Curse Forge because uh, I used to, like, back in the day when World of Warcraft was out, um, I was one of the people who was writing a whole load of the popular uh, or contributing to some of the multi-people deals. Uh, a lot of the add-ons that people use to play that game uh, and stuff like that. I've, I've done that for years as a hobby, you know, building add-ons for games. Um, so, you yeah. know, I, I got involved in that. In theory, to start with, I was just helping a bit uh, around the sides, you know, because I knew a lot about D&D. They very quickly realized, hey, actually, we need someone who's an absolute expert on this and who can do all the stuff that the rest of the team can't. So um, my coding background meant I could I could jump in, and uh, so I became very quickly became responsible for building out the books, the digital books on D and D Beyond, um, building uh, all of the rules and for how they worked in all the various different, uh, whether it be subclasses or whether it be magic items, backgrounds, stuff like that. And it just kind of snowballed from there because every time there's a gap, I'm like, yeah, no problems, I can do that. So, and when did you first? No, this was this would be 2017, 2018, or it's 2017, yeah, yeah. So you were you were at the ground level when this thing launched. Yeah, right. I mean, that, that that was like uh, for the for the beta, right? For uh, when it was going to kick off, right? But and it was just SRD, and there was a kind of shocking carriage sheet but you know um, when you're uh, trying to get to market with a, uh, a minimal viable product sometimes uh, you know it's not going to be the best it's not going to be the prettiest how was how was this experience by the way like was was it was it a pleasant one working on this project yeah i mean everybody uh, there is like a small team so it's very much a everybody put a lot of effort and a lot of work in to get stuff done um because you know everybody knew that we were building some really cool stuff. Um, now I'm over in the UK, right? So I didn't really work like most. They're all in the office in, uh, in Alabama, and they were doing stuff. So I just worked with one directly with one or two members of the team there to be able to get stuff done. But uh, I, and that all that all shifted when uh, <clears throat> when Curse got sold to Twitch. So. Um, and then a lot of stuff got moved off to over to fandom so we ended up over at fandom as right. a part of that part of that and they set up like a fandom tabletop as a separate business part with inside that business and actually invested uh fandom themselves didn't really understand what they'd got they wanted to buy the uh the wiki side of things so mm -hmm. you know curse ran uh uh, Gamepedia, which was like you know one of the biggest sets of uh, gaming wikis out there, and uh, fandom had their own. So they were like, "Hey, we'll just buy that," and then we've got it all in one place. Uh, and with that, because Twitch, Twitch would look at D and D Beyond and go, "We don't even know what this is. It doesn't fit with our business model. Just kind of leave it alone in the corner. Uh, let's right. just pack it into this. You get this as well if you want to buy the wikis." Um, so we ended up over there. Um, they uh, they invested and uh, you know a lot a lot more staff were hired and the business grew and uh, you know it went year on year it just it snowballed it was uh, it, it just every time we estimated where we we're going to be in terms of numbers of users and the revenue and everything it just massively exceeded it way more than anybody ever expected. Were we were you still part of the company when Blizzard took it over in 2022? Yeah, I was. Yeah, so I, I came over to uh, Wizards of the Coast uh, as part of that. Moved into role of uh, senior producer for digital content, uh, Dungeon uh, um, D and D. How was that experience compared to the previous? Because like, you changed hands, well, you know, this this idea D and D beyond shifted hands three times. How, how did the the infrastructure and the corporate etiquette change as it shifted into Wizards? Yeah, I mean, there was a really strong focus on, uh, hey, you know, there was a, a change over period where the, both systems were in play, getting everything gone. And the absolute focus there was, let's make sure everything stays stable. We can't disrupt the user experience um, and, you know, allow the team to carry on doing what it what it does. And then we'll focus on moving everything over to, like, the Wizards of the Coast way of doing things. Right. Um, it was a big culture shift very much for the entire team. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So that's you know, we were able to demonstrate value very quickly in terms of the way that we approach things and we're able to give a lot of really valuable feedback. One of, one of the core parts of my job, uh, as soon as we'd got that immediate, hey, everything's over and it's all still stable, was working with the uh, production team over on the book side of things. So, you know, to kind of really improve that whole physical to digital pipeline and make sure that it was like a two-way street. So where there's a lot of things like, hey, beforehand, as with all of the other third-party uh, providers, we'd be given the book files like a couple of months, two, three months before release of the book so that we could work on it and build the content on the site. Same deal with Roll20, Fantasy Rounds, et cetera. Receive all the files like two, three months out. Uh, making sure I don't say anything that would be like commercially sensitive in terms of the way of any of this works, but once d, d Beyond was owned by Wizards of the Coast, that relationship needed to change. And I was at the forefront of trying to map that out, and making sure that we improved it. And that includes us being able to absolutely dissect the rules and content that's being created before it's finalized, which is amazing to be able to sit with the, you know, talk to the actual designers of the game and say, hey, actually, this is going to cause this problem in these ways. And, uh, we change that and uh, being able to give that feedback and actually influence the course of the game it's pretty cool wow cool and and so what what prompted like what prompted the departure like when you decided to leave um <clears throat> so let's just go with the uh, official statement which <laughs> is that no, uh, you can, you can, you could you could phrase it however you want yeah yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the official statement is as simple as, uh, you know, I, I was laid off. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say anything bad about Wizards of the Coast around that. Uh, and my own experience, I think uh, we, we all know from uh, the way that things happen yearly there that there's, uh, you know, especially I looked at what's just happened uh, around Christmas recently. There were mm. a lot of people, including some really tenured, very experienced people who've been laid off. And then within a couple of months, they're hiring for the same role again, but on less pay and for a more junior title. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, it's it's one of those situations there. And then, and then, how long were you like out? Like, how how long were you a freelancer before you found your next uh, your next gig? So I decided I was taking a few months off and, uh, you know, to be able to focus on myself and, uh, um, you yeah, know, family for a little bit uh, and then to look around for, uh, you know, for another opportunity or maybe decide to you know, go my own way and do my own thing. Uh, it was about, so I, I had a cool down period as part of that, so, which is, you know, pretty normal with these things. Um, so it was six months and two days after uh, I, I left that uh, I ended up uh, talking to Dave Scott, who was the CEO of Evil Genius Games, and uh, pitched him an idea around what we could do digitally, which matched you know, um, a lot of the ideas that he was already having himself. And what was your, uh, what, what, what were your, um, what, was your, what was your job at Evil Genius? So my yeah. job there was uh, chief product officer. Um, <clears throat> so I was also, in charge of tech as well so it was a pretty busy job with, with you know two big hats so tech across the entire business um largely i was building the technical solutions that sort of the company aspired to be able to create to envisage the future of role play games you know and that very much matches my own uh, desires of being able to help facilitate the role play uh, industry itself get better and when i say better i mean more accessible provide tools and cool things for people to use rather than tell people what they should or shouldn't be doing yeah it's really interesting because like there's still this um especially within my age demographic people who still prefer sitting people around a table and running things with with you to keep it a little digital um you know additions uh peripherals uh, so 
like how how does your how does your approach like it's one of those situations where how important do you think uh, a digital footprint for a role playing game is nowadays? I think it's becoming more and more important, um, <clears throat> massively so. Uh, there are two things that have happened within the last sort of uh, with, well within the last five years that really changed the shape of things. Uh, one is COVID hit. And that has forever changed the way that we professionally consider uh, communications, right? People, so many more people are still able to work from home and do work that before everybody considered had to be in an office job and that's changed. And the way that people get together, a uh, friendship group that I've got that's uh, always got together like, every, like once a month to uh, play in person, switched to playing and went, hey, look, we can just play weekly. So we started playing weekly online. Nobody has to travel, this is way easier. I still love to play in person. <clears throat> That's still my preferred way of playing, yeah? I'd much rather sit around a table with friends, roll actual dice, move figures around a map or uh, you know, or just stand up and gesticulate with my arms as I describe uh, an amazing scene that's going down before them. But that's just not possible a lot of the time. Or uh, if someone's a ro um, you know somebody who has their own role playing game company at home, what kind of advice would you give them to try to increase their potential digital footprint, with which could inevitably lead to to more success? Um, <clears throat> all right, I, I'm not going to answer that directly right now. I'm going to get a slight segue, which is there is a real struggle because if you look around. The other thing that happened is D&D Beyond happened mm -hmm. and something that that site does amazingly well is shift the barrier from learning the rules to being able to play the game. And my watch phrase uh, throughout all of my um, time within the tabletop industry has been players don't want to read the rules, players want to play the game. So let's do what we can to enable them to play the game. If you take a look at the way video games have changed over the decades, you know, when I first uh, bought uh, you know, a complicated video game, it would come with like a thick manual that told you how to play it. That's just, nobody considers that to be a reasonable thing to do anymore. No, the no, game no. has tutorials and it shows you how to play the game. And the start of every video game is designed in a way that teaches you the mechanics you need to know as you need to know them. And this is a core philosophy for a lot of uh, user experience design now, but somehow it's just not really come into tabletop role play as a design in the way that we do things. Um, I don't really know why, and I'm not really embedded into that design side of games. And <laughs> there's, uh, I think, a lot of the time what happens, especially around D&D &D and 5e, because let's face it, it does dominate such a large part of the sector, is everybody that's creating 5e content just kind of tries to copy the way that Wizards does stuff. I know Wizards themselves are looking to try and change things. Um, again, what I can say is somewhat limited because commercially sensitive, but there is a big desire to change things in the way that exactly what I was describing. I was part of quite a lot of discussions around how we go about doing that. Because it's important that we reduce the barrier to play if we want to allow people to play. Um, the people who play role play games at the moment, uh, the age has kind of got shifted up a bit than it used to because it's harder to get into. Um, People expect things to be much easier to pick up these days than it used to be when we were younger. And, you yeah. know, you, you get your book and that was it because, hey, maybe you're going to be sitting on a train for a while or something, you could just read it or whatever, or you've got time and you didn't have the internet in your fingers. So there's a lot of different media styles, like watching videos like this is a source of information. Right. I, you know, I'm not saying things need to change, but the opportunity is there for us to do things in a better way that embraces a whole new um, sector of people who can play the games. And the difficulty for small businesses and independent publishers is, you know, they're really struggling to be able to get just 
the standard PDF of the gamebook to get the right bit, or you might be able to do a small print run or print on demand, because they have to be a publisher, they have to be an editor, they have to be an art director, they have to like get artists, they have to get writers. There's all these people, all these professional skills to make a really good quality book. And then you add on top of that that you've got to think about how you can distribute it digitally. Um, it's kind of tough, you know? Um, you look at drive through RPG, that's pretty much the standard way within the industry of uh, of publishing your digital book. I think there's better ways of doing things, and I think there needs to be a shift, and I think it needs to embrace and welcome independent publishers rather than leaving them in the cold. So, like for me, like obviously, like there's been a lot of talk about what the wizards are planning on doing uh, uh -huh. in, the next, in the next pitch with the next new version of uh, in whatever uh, state that comes into, whether or not it's just a slight modification of five, or as some alarmists are saying that it's a straight over new edition that will be compatible with fifth edition, which I don't think is going to happen. Um, okay. And it's, and then the worry is whether or not they're going to find a way to do to divorce and segregate what they're doing as an entirely separate entity as a way of trying to. Like I said, kind of separate themselves from everybody else there, D and D, and then there's the rest, and then they get their own little entity with their own little piece of the pie. So for me, I, I, I'm, I'm worried about whether or not, um, at least you know, for long, for there was a, a big golden period where everybody could make money under the umbrella of D and D because yeah. D and D was in many ways playing in the same playground with us. And it seems like in some situations that Wizard wants to get their own sandbox and not invite anyone else in there. Are you worried? Like, because obviously this is going to skew into the into the. I can't I can't remember who it was uh, in, in our circles that had commented that the golden age of role playing was dead. It was a very controversial topic. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? And and, and in this melange of a mess of ideas, like what's what what are your thoughts on that? So. I mean, how Wizards plays this is uh, going to be massively impactful, right? Uh, we've seen that they don't always play it the way that people expect. Um, there's a couple of things. One is, you know, there was the whole mess around the OGL and the desire to change the licensing terms and the way that that worked, and uh, we all know what happened there. I don't want to drag back over that. Um, <clears throat> there is a lot of concern amongst people I've spoken to in the industry, you know, um, ex-colleagues and, uh, you know, and friends that I've made, who are concerned that exactly as you say, Wizards might say, hey, look, the new edition, whatever they call it, is not under that kind of licensing. So it becomes very much, hey, th this is our sandpit, our sandbox, and uh, you're not welcome in it. Or if you are, if you want to be in here, you've got to pay us some money to participate. And that will lock a lot of people out. And there's a lot of concern about that. And whether that's something they'll do or not, I don't know. Um, I've got some ideas on, based on knowledge that I have, but again, can't talk about. It's been a year, it's been over a year since I last worked there. So, you know, things move on, people learn, and there's some really solid, good people working there. What I do know is that it's been publicly stated that, you know, uh, Wizards of the Coast want to make uh, Dungeons & Dragons the next, uh, you know, billion dollar IP for the Hasbro, uh, just like Magic the Gathering. So, you know, they need to really up the game there and approach a whole new bunch of people and make a lot more money. You know, they've got to significantly increase the amount of money they're earning to be able to do that. And that's not gonna happen through organic growth. So I don't know what their plans are. What I do know is if they do set up that uh, sandpit that makes everything theirs and lock out third party creators. Last time they tried that, we ended up with Pathfinder. And look what happened for us for a good couple of years third party products became more popular than the official dungeons and dragons right during the era of fourth edition if you look back to all the stats on the end world where they tracked some of that stuff and you can go back and refer to it 
um, you know, official Dungeons and Dragons, came in second or third place consistently for you know a good chunk of time. If they're smart, they need to make they need to have learned that part of history and just make sure they don't go back to that place. But honestly, it might be better for the industry if that happens. Yeah, which comes into the worry because for for me as someone that got into this profession at that time, um, my company was the first to sign on to the GSL, uh, yeah. which was obviously you know at the time there was a lot of alarmists, a lot of uh, concern. You know, um, we found out later the conversations that we're having uh, where the writing was on the wall even before the GSL came out and that um, the, the the beginnings of Paizo, uh, Pathfinder, and a few others uh, started months earlier before the release of even 4th uh, edition. Uh, I decided to take the risk and go, well, I'm not... You know, I'm going to sign up to the fourth to the GSL, and I, I never had any bad experiences. But the sales were certainly weren't there. But for a lot of us, it it exploded with the fifth edition specifically, and and with yeah. a massive uh, boom. Uh, for me, I have often said the fact that uh, I had I, I I had had conversation with a few people, um, uh, Mike Merles and so forth, and so I was aware that they were planning on making fifth edition a um uh, an ogl or i put out an sp and and there were a lot of other ideas that they had which did not come to pass uh based on those conversations okay. uh things that they're talking about doing now which i thought was like it's interesting like he, he brought those up as a long-term strategy back in 2014 and i was like well we're 10 years time soon and Seeing the explosion of million dollar Kickstarters using the fifth edition label, a lot of people believe that that was a golden age. And there has been a, a, a very also volatile controversy going on right now about what the definition of a golden age is. Yeah. And I'll ask you what you think that is. I have my own idea, but I'm asking you what you think. What, what does the golden age of role playing mean to you? I'm like, you know, my reference frame reference there has to be towards where we talk about like the golden age of comic books, or the golden age of the movie industry. And a lot of that is wrapped up in um, <clears throat> nostalgia. Because, you know, at the time, if you look back at it, like what is considered to be the golden era of movies or the golden area of you know, Hollywood and uh, comic books, they didn't really refer to it as that back then. It's only afterwards that that kind of label got really applied. We started talking about the Silver Age, the Gold Age. I, I don't think it's possible to state things like that until you're really out of them and can look back and look at where it was and then look at what caused the decline and what caused it to get to where it was and what was actually you know, the levers within the industry. Uh, certainly, there was, you know, you could definitely say it was a golden age for third party creators to be able to step into a space where they could make a lot of money with some good products. And then it's become somewhat saturated. It's now much harder because if you want, if you've got a great idea that you want to release this campaign that's worth setting, this game world that you've spent 10 years of your life working on, visiting, it's got to have some real differentiators that make it different to the couple of hundred others out there, right? That other people have created and published. Why would people want yours? It's got to have some top tier art. It's really expensive now to get into. We had this period where, as you say, we can get these million, you know, million dollar uh, Kickstarters for these amazing ideas people's had. It's so much harder to do that now because you've got to have a lot more money up front to be able to drop on the really clean, um, high quality art, all the writing, and you've got to have things almost ready to go now. If you look at the Kickstarter and the way it's gone over the last sort of few years, um, they're all so much smoother now. And there's a lot of, there's several companies out there, like if you look at what Come On have been doing, and I, I know they've shifted over to GameFound there, but they've used that as a model. And there's other businesses that have done that as well, as a way of effectively using Kickstarter and other. <coughs> Um, platforms as a means of 
of pre-orders for their sales for their books uh, makes it slightly less risky because you've got the money up front before you do your print run there's a lot of reasons it makes a lot of sense but it means those independent creators <clears throat> are now competing in that crowdfunding space against professional companies whereas that wasn't the case before so i think yeah. Yeah, that's the harder bit that people are now finding there is like for me um whenever i think about like when someone talks about the golden age of cinema uh yeah. and the golden age of comics uh, I, for example we're in a situation uh, similar with uh, movies nowadays like there are anybody can make a movie uh, everyone can access to digital cameras uh i love the yeah. irony where van hoyt won an oscar just a few days ago at the time of this recording yeah. and he was championing the push to go back to celluloid and I laughed at it and said, what a delusional man, because he's in a position where he has access to $100 million films, and he doesn't realize that 99.9% .9 of everybody out there can't afford celluloid filmmaking. And so there were, and the fact that uh, a wonderful film, I do love this film called The Creator that came out last year, that was shot using, even though it had an Oscar-winning cinematographer, the employee a camera that you can buy from Future Shop or Best Buy for uh, for about $3,000. Uh, and I just did a shoot last week uh, for a short film, and we were using a red camera, a lot more expensive, they're still digital. And you can say, well, no. But the issue, as you said, there is now, thanks to streaming, a deluge of movies being made that nobody is really watching, or they watch once and they forget about them. So if you make a movie, congratulations, it's so much easier to make a movie. Everybody needs to make a movie and to stream content. They'll pay you for your movie. You'll be seen a lot. And it seems like that people are getting these films. Have that same as you comment the fact it's easier to, to get out there to make something but now the only people are making them that they are being uh buried by the deluge of content and for me i always think of a golden age of cinema for me was that that era where digital just came out but we didn't have streaming so it was in that wonderful period between 2005 and 2018 where we could people could make films at home using digital cameras and we had a surge of really good directors that came out same thing with comics i think the age of comics was in the 90s not in the 60s and 70s yeah. because we've had we had ballsy storytelling coming out just amazingly courageous uh stories coming out and so when i look at the golden age of they talk about the 60s and 70s they go yeah but it was a lot of um whiteness so there, was a, there was a skew of what stories were being told, and it wasn't until the 90s, which is when I started working at a comic book store, I started to see a lot crazier stuff coming out from independent publishers, Vertigo, and a whole bunch of others. Uh, so uh, there's this divide between uh, some people who believe the golden age of role-playing games was also in the 90s, where you could get away with doing really risky stuff because no one really cared you could have line art you could have jpegs i mean i have mechton 2 uh from Roll towers orient and it was basically made on an old apple II. and we look at uh we didn't have but there was but there was no dominant system there was no complete control so we had a hundred different systems you could play a game you could learn the rules and so i see a lot of people trying to make the case that that was the golden age Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, and the Golden Age died with the release of 2003, uh, with 3.5, three, third edition, more with 3.5, which came out a couple years later. And then the rise of drive through RPG, which started to really come into its own in the mid-2000s. I mean, I'm, I'm going to look at 90s. Uh, I played, I bought and played so many different role-play games in the 90s, right? I mean, I love something I played, like, Literally, it's going to be closing on a hundred different systems throughout the 90s. I'd go to uh, conventions and try everything that I'd not played before, right? I'd go to my local game store and we'd test out, like, you know, what are the new games that you've got in? And some of them were, you know, as you say, it's black and white A4, um, you know, pamphlets almost that have been put into production because someone got their hands on a photocopier and it's just some line art in there that uh, somebody's uh, friend drew. 
uh, but they saw publication and people bought them, people played them. Um, I think to me that's very much more the self rage because you've got this whole thing where, like comic books, you had this proliferation of awareness and they've got more game stores servicing it. It's not just like, hey, here's uh, Dungeons and Dragons when it came out, like the red box and stuff. That was, I, I bought that in just a regular toy store, right? And then you started getting dedicated game stores that had enough to be able to do flexible card games here. And they were drawing so many other people in as well. And that became a massive thing. Um, that's the hallmark of the 90s for me, it really was, as you say, a lot of independent and smaller creators being able to get these amazing, cool and fun games out there that were, you know, could really take chances and risks. I think, like, yeah, I agree with you entirely that when third edition, especially 3.5 hit, like D&D kind of became this kind of gorilla in the room kind of thing. Uh, there was this weirdness where as Rose would say, the whole thing with fourth edition, but then 5e really dominated and it brought it in and it just dominated so much of the PTRPG space in terms of, uh, you know, what people expect from a role play game and what even people consider role play games to be. I started working with uh, AI um, within the last couple of years in terms of uh, being able to use that not to create um, TTRPG content, but to help facilitate and assist people, especially where we're looking at people who have disabilities, to be able to um, run and play role play games. And one of the interesting things I discovered with that, with the, especially with the original chat GPT and the open AI, it had this bond of equivalence between Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop role play games. It actually perceived them as the same things. So if you tried to get it, if you tried to talk to it about tabletop role play games, it automatically put fantasy stuff in there. It would put dragons and spells, even if you were trying to tell it that, hey, I, I don't want those things in here. Um, the golden age, I think, is yet to actually come, where we go through undergo an, another renaissance almost, where it becomes we remove the barrier to publishing digitally and making the games playable digitally. And we reduce the barrier to be able to publish physically. I think there are ways and means of doing this that just haven't come to the industry yet that will again further enable independent creators to be able to create uh, what they want and make it available to everybody. The I don't think we're there yet. I think it's still to come. Like for me, like I said, as somebody that saw a, a, a colossal spike in my own revenue, like I said, I don't, uh, I quit my day job uh, in 2018 and have been yeah. able to be a full time publisher. And I remember a very, a very conversation I remember, which was yeah. the guy who ran um, um, uh, Green Road and said at the time we talked, he said, more people have walked on the moon than make their career, a full time career from tabletop role playing. Uh, this was 15, probably 20 years ago when he said this. Uh -huh. And and now there's actually probably thousands, if not, you know, actually probably thousands of people that can do their career in, in tabletop role play in some capacity. Yeah. For me, there's, there's two things. A, is that uh, thanks to self-publishing, but also, I hate to say this, the the extremely reliable and well-structured assist infrastructure uh that is in china the fact that like the same thing with board games you yeah. can uh, like 40 years ago if you want to make a board game you have to call four different companies you call a company in china like panda or long pack and say this is my board game idea and they're like okay we have every machine in-house that can do every aspect of production and going to a print company like like I do, because I go to a print company, like, oh, yeah, we can do lenticular, we can do all this, we can do leather wrap, we can do all of this for you. It's this is expensive. This is how much to drop it into a distributor. Just give it the files and we'll do the rest. It drops that, that, that barrier. And then we have self-published and we have PDF. Um, and there's a, couple, there's a couple gates within that. One is... Uh, as we talked about, the the production design standards are going higher. People are looking for snazzier looking books. Where back in in the eighties, we were okay with with chicken scratches. 
Um, and that was a mark of, of, of quality. Like, oh, there is a illustration. That's yeah. something. It was, you know, like when the first color book started coming out in the 90s, like that was, it was 10 or 15 years before we started seeing color pages. And now color pages are synonymous as role playing and a lot of perspective. But people don't realize that was almost 15 years of black and white illustrations before we started seeing color. Yeah. People don't realize that Cyberpunk 2070, uh, Cyberpunk is, well, 2020, one of the most popular games of all time. I, I was like, did you guys ever see that book? It's, 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 it's a rough book. It's wonderful for its age, but if you look at it now, you would never pick that up uh, because of the way it looks, but it's, it has a legendary status because of, of what it was. But for me, I'm worried about the next gate that is still closed. And I'm not talking about the future that you're talking about. I'm talking about the fact that people want their titles on Fantasy Grounds, on Roll20, and Foundry. We have three different systems that are run differently with a different infrastructure different ways of making it i can't create a module for fantasy grounds and then just port it over to roll 20. the whoever I, whoever i'm paying for to do a roll 20 conversion has to learn a completely different system in order to create that same system for foundry and there's also a massive cost involved um I, I spent years trying to find people to convert my games to Roll20 and Foundry. And I, it was, people would come up for a project, they would see the technicality, the technical challenges, and they would quit. Like, I, like oh, the project sucks. The people come in and go, I'll do it. I'm, I'm, I'm good with computers. And they're like, oh, no, I'm not doing this. And the people who would, or we companies say, we'll do it for you, and it will cost $8,000, which is a giant money sink that's more expensive. Like, it's almost, it's almost as expensive to do a print run than it is to pay someone to convert your game to Roll20. So I'm worried now that people's insistence on there being a digital interactive element like Roll20 or Foundry or other VTTs is going to create another gate that is going to prevent people from getting into the industry. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, we're already there. That gate's already in place. You know? yeah. And sometimes when I look back at what's happened with uh, the work that I did with d and Beyond and the way that we focused on being able to reduce that barrier with like the character build, make it super simple. You don't need to know what everything is. Like you can just pick the options through there and just put, 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 there we go, I've made my character. Um, <clears throat> Roll20 have improved the way they're doing stuff. Fantasy Grounds has improved. There's other systems out there. But like There's Hero Labs. There's uh, You look at Foundry as well as a VTT. And I'm minded of... Um, there's a very famous XKCD uh, comic that uh, talks about you know, you've got like two engineers being frustrated that there's like seven different standards for how stuff go and like everything has to address those. They set out to create a universal standard for everything. And then like the last panel is now there are eight standards, you know? Um, and I think that's kind of what we're seeing is there's some really lofty goals that have been established for people doing stuff. You look at the way that Demiplane have approached things and they're like, we want to make this, um, you know, Adam Bradford's been a lot of the visionary behind that, the guy who actually was in charge at D&D Beyond from the start. And, you know, the vision there is very much, we want to provide this single place where you can play all of the different games with the way that you're used to and the same kind of tools. But you're exactly right, which is if you want to make that, it's effectively dive taking your target audience and they're split amongst these systems. I know people go, well, I'll only play it if it's on D&D Beyond, or I'll only play it if it's on Fandra, I'll only play it if it's on Roll20. So you've got to like, do all this work on there. Uh, I was involved in a bit of that uh, when I was at Evil Genius Games. And like, you know, it comes down to the amount of money it costs to get a really good implementation of one of those systems. And the amount of time it takes as well it means it's not going to be coming out when the book's released. So, uh, yeah, it's a huge barrier. And there's a potential that it's getting worse as more systems come out and more partnerships are formed. I've seen recently, we've got Alchemy, we've got uh, Shard, uh, Starfall pieces, but, you know, there's, there's all these other um, systems. And if we're expecting the creators to pay money, somebody to do that, yeah, 
it's increasing the value rather than making it easier, which was almost the opposite objective of the people who are building these sites in the first place. The and the and the funny thing, this is connected to a conversation that I was having, which uh, was one of the most hated videos that I posted on my own personal channel. I said, that's a big one because I've, I've, I was always I've always had a measured response to the whole OGL fiasco. I was just like, mm -hmm. I just I didn't want to I didn't want to throw I didn't want to scream boycott. I wasn't going to get angry. And the fact that I wasn't calling boycotts and wasn't getting angry was causing people to wanting to boycott me because I wasn't on their side. And I said, I'm not taking sides. I'm saying the fact that can we have a civilized conversation? Uh, and that was not a conversation anyone wanted to have. And it was similar to AI when, when I was asking questions and people weren't interested in answering the questions. Uh, but the video for this one was about the same barrier, which you talked about. We talked about the digital barrier. I think there's also an analog mechanical barrier with the rule systems themselves. What I, what uh, that's very famous comment that went around about golden age of role playing dying, what he was referring to specifically was the fact that 99, 95% of anyone who was in the tabletop role-playing market, no matter how many rule systems they knew, they knew one that a lot of people knew, which was 5th edition D&D. &D. No matter, you can play GURPS, you can know Cyberpunk, but chances are you knew how to play 5e D&D. &D. And if you gathered any seven or eight, if you gathered any group of people together, the random folks who are all playing tabletop, and like, hey, we're going to play a game, what systems do you guys know? Guaranteed, everyone's going to have 5e in their work, in their portfolio. Yeah. Right? And so we're, we're, we're going to play 5e because it's so much easier for us to just get together rather than try to teach three people a system that they don't know. And that creates this, this, this wonderful system where suddenly we can focus on content and not have to deal with the intricacies of trying to balance a new system from the ground up. Yep. And when I was commenting the fact that why why don't we look at fifth edition as the same operating system that we look at Windows, Mac OS, the Steam platform? Why why like, and that was kind of and it was it was such a hated video because people felt the golden age was as many systems as possible. So those everyone has variety and everyone can choose what you want. They don't want the monopoly, the implied monopoly of of D D. Where me as the publisher, as a gamer, I also a publisher is yeah, but you do realize back in 2014, I released one game for five different systems. It took me four years to produce that one book for four different systems because they were different systems and the fifth edition version outsells all of those other ones combined. And I can't ignore that simple fact. Yeah. Um, and since then, it's even spiked even more, I think. You know, um, there are companies making inroads. You look at Watson Free League are doing. And as I say, you know, you, you look at uh, Demplane and Roll20 kind of pushing out into other areas. Um, I think you've absolutely nailed it there in that if I I'm talking to a bunch of people that I don't really know, or maybe you know they're kind of you know friends of friends, and I'm like, hey, you know, um, let's get a game together. It, it's almost certainly going to be a 5e game because that's what they know, unless we want to spend time reading rule books. And this comes back to <clears throat> what I was floating to you earlier, which is that players don't want to read rules; they want to play games. And if they already know the rules, that makes it really easy for them. They don't want to have to go learn more rules. And I know so many people like that, where I've tried to set up games to do, you know, I, I love Dark Conspiracy. My absolute favorite um, games ever, or cyberpunk uh, genre. I love uh, Cyberpunk Red 2020, um, Shadowrun, all the various incarnations of that. And there's a lot of other games around that. But trying to play any of those online with people, or even in person, where I'm like, I've got this two inch thick rule book here. Um, you don't need to read all of it, but you know, um, there's certainly some bits of this and I'm gonna have to spend hours walking each of you through your characters to make sure that uh, you know we get it all built. But if I wanna run a 5e game, I can literally just add a campaign on D&D Beyond, just give them a link and just let them do what, you know, let them figure out. And uh, a couple of hours later, we're ready to roll. It's that video game comparison that you made. The fact that if you're yeah. playing a first-person shooter, you're 
it, we've all been programmed after 50, 60 years of playing a first person shooter, our hands automatically go to the WASD keys. We don't go, oh, wait, wait, this, this game is using IJKL. Why in the world are they doing that? Our brain to the point that most games, when you start a first person shooter, they don't even tell you. Your hand just automatically programs to go into the WASD keys because you know this is how a first person shooter is played. And right, and you hit spacebar if you want to jump over something, right? And, yeah. and all of these things, and we all know that. And the people that write these games, uh, and I think the video games industry is a good leap ahead of the tabletop role play games industry in terms oh, of addressing this. Um, and you know, and they learn from mistakes. But in those early days, yeah, there, there were. You know, you would get customizations to like how, what different key keyboard layouts do you want? And there was like several competing standards, as it were, for the, the keyboard layouts. And they just all gave way in the end uh, because uh, pretty much doom and quake happened, right? And, uh, and that became WASD for moving around. Um, and, the, and why fight it? Well, why not just use that in your game? But there's so much more can be added on top of that in the way that video games address things um should we just use a d20 system as the basis for everything i think that's uh, a lot of people have some very strong opinions around that end of the day we're just rolling dice as randomization um i had a very long philosophical discussion with uh, a couple of ex-colleagues recently about this in that I love collaborative storytelling. That's what I love about role play games. Some people just want to get in a dungeon and like kick doors, smash monsters, grab treasure. And that's great. We should all be able to play the games we want. I love being able to give my players uh, just part, at least part control over the narrative of games and giving them the ability to be able to influence the way the game is told because we're building a story between us. And, you know, um, the people that play in my games, they very quickly learn that I'm only getting us to roll dice when it actually matters that there should be a randomness to the outcome of something. I, I don't call for skill checks, whatever the game system is, unless they really need it. I'm, I'm 100%. Right? I am such, I think, you know, yeah, there's certain things um, that, that we can call out. Like, here's the thing is that I don't, Whatever we talk about, when I talk about defending Five uh, E, I, I yeah. I'm not saying I'm not defending the letter of Five E. In fact, when I was doing fourth edition stuff, I was very oftenly called out for, as they called it, breaking fourth, fourth edition philosophy. And yeah. I was trying to go, well, can you explain to me what that is? Who's? It's like, well, you can't do this. This this game is not built for this. And I'm like, no, it's it is it's it's all in pencil to me. Everything can change, yeah. uh, and uh, you brought it up perfectly. I, I, when I've been looking at new ideas to to mate onto these systems, I look at video games and go, okay, what's cool going on with this video game, and can I completely restructure how classes work within fifth edition? And someone says, has no. I'm like, don't tell me what I can't do. I think these are all things that can happen, but having that baseline understanding, like, oh. I have ability checks. I have like I have certain skills. This, these are my skills. There are certain things where some people don't like that. But for me, if you have some common ground, some common anchor points, WAS keys, space to jump, you know, that reduces that barrier of learning. I'm like, well, this someone looks at it and says, oh, but this reminds me of D and D. I'm like, yeah, you're fifty percent there. I'm just gonna add, tell you how things are a little different now. Yeah. Right, it just seems like so many people are so married to the idea of of trying to strip D and D out of the tabletop role playing game market because of this uh, corporate hatred. And I was kind of saying, like, well, you know, Fifth Edition isn't actually owned by anyone anymore. So I why mean, why we vilify? Right, you, you can't copyright a framework on how the rules work. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to say that you know. Uh, where I was going with the narrative storytelling is like some people prefer to just play the rules and that's fine. But you then look at what can you do to change those rules and it's still effectively the same game that people understand. You know, you could say, hey, um, I was talking with someone recently who's building a, um, using basically the 5A rules, but they're built as a, as a classless system. 
and changed the uh, the way the rules work for characters, for creating your character, for advancing your character, but you still have levels. And the rest of the mechanics are still the same, right? So the actual barrier to being able to play it once you've got your character of like, hey, you're still rolling a d20, you've got your attack bonus, and that tells you what AC you've hit, and it's still the same familiar game, but they've changed character mechanics. Or what if you say, hey, we're not going to use a d20, we're going to use 2d10 instead, uh, because that changes the probability curve, yeah. because it's still familiar enough at that point huh, what about if you start using some of the actual rules that are in there for like optimal rules, like using a proficiency die rather than a proficiency bonus? Most people like freak out a little bit about that one. That's actually in the rule books. So you kind of get this, um, and I saw this with working at Evil Dreams Games with the Everyday Heroes stuff there, where the, you know, they based it on it, but changed a lot. And hey, some of that was really good design. Some of it, uh, I, I personally felt kind of went a bit too far away and out of the familiarity zone and caused people some problems, but most people like those games when they play them. And I see the same with pretty much any role play game. People like them once they understand the, the difference between what they know and what they now need to know. And that's the bit that I'm talking about. We need to learn from video games and how we introduce people from Here's the stuff you already know. You know, you can jump into the game, WASD space bar, use your mouse, you can run around. And we've not actually had to tell you anything yet about our game. And then you hit the first bit where it's like, hey, you know, press the F key to interact with this and start crafting, or, you know, press the, uh, you know, uh, press the R key to reload or, or, or whatever the mechanics are for that game. And they need to be sufficiently familiar that people can understand the concept, even if the implementation is slightly different from that game. And I think that's kind of what we need to learn a lot of with tabletop. And you're right, it's a very, um, it's a very emotive topic because a lot of designers and a lot of players love other games that are completely different. You know, you look at the similarities with something like Role Master and D&D. There's, you know, both fancy games, but the actual rule system is so different. 